ah, there we go. Um, then we go through what the, the geodata analysts are doing in the implementation of the whole process. Then the history of the data management with spreadsheets. I'm going to talk about the migration itself to Postgres database and then to set up QGIS to interact with the database. Um, and then obviously <laughs> there's always challenges with projects like these. I'm going to talk about the QGIS themes and some attribute forms, um, some workflows and tricks that we did um, and the challenges. And if there is time, I'm going to show you a few things on QGIS um, just to see how it works. So <clears throat> the mobile infrastructure company is in Naumburg in Germany, in Eastern Germany, in the old Eastern Germany. Um, it is basically a state-owned enterprise with an envisaged um, lifespan of five years. Um, and the company basically does the funding of mobile tower infrastructure. So the company uses government money to fund the building of the towers. So we go through a process, which is a location assessment. So we just check the radio technical details. Uh, we are looking for properties where we can put the tower. Uh, we obviously need power to get these things running. We need the fiber optics to basically connect to the network. And then you need the contracts um, with the network providers and the property owners. Um, and then we also do the monitoring of the progress. But we also do little other jobs like advice and analysis for other state companies where, for example, is 5G on the autobahn. Um, or we do on-site consulting for communities where we know there is no mobile coverage. So <clears throat> how does the whole process work? Firstly, we do the mobile network analysis just to check where is coverage or not. Um, then we prioritize those areas, and I'm going to get to that a little bit later. Um, then we discuss those areas that we propose or that we prioritize with the federal states. Um, we look what will the mobile network operators say to this. Are they interested or not? Um, and then we create the so-called search circles. I'll come to that. We check again if the mobile network operators are happy with those search circles. Um, then we create the candidates. Um, it's basically the tower location planner looks where can we put the tower in the field. And then we uh, ask the network operators again and the property owners if we can build the tower where we think it should be. And then we hand it over. This is basically the process that the geodata analysts are doing and supporting. And then we hand it over to funding management, contracts with property owners, contracts with the network providers, et cetera, et cetera. And in the end, um, a tower is built, as you can see at the bottom. Um, <clears throat> so what does all these terms that, that we use <laughs> before we get to those? Because we obviously show them in the project and we need them in the project. Um, what do they actually mean? So firstly, we have the mobile coverage gap. I'm not sure if you can see that, but this little light blue ones is an area where there's no mobile coverage. And when we talk about mobile coverage, we, we talk LTE, 4G or greater or better. Um, then we have got the so-called so market assessment area. So once we've got the mobile gaps, we then create an area around that. Um, and this is normally done by a script. Um, and then we hand it over to the planners. They do the so-called search circle, which is the first assessment of the area. They put a point there, um, and you can see the centroid, and the circle is actually two kilometer radius around this spot. And the search circle is a theoretical coverage that the tower will give you, which is not, not real, the real coverage. Um, then obviously we have to create the tower candidate, which might be at the exact same location as the search circle, but it doesn't have to be, because it might be that you have to move the candidate somewhere else, because the search circle, there's no property available or whatever it is, and the, mo and the um, mobile coverage would be better 100 meters away or 500 meters away or whatever it is. 
Um, <clears throat> then obviously we need the power connections. We indica also indicate them on the map. So the nearest power, closest power, it doesn't help the closest power is 10 kilometers away, then the tower will not be feasible. So it needs to be close by. And we need to take existing mobile towers, obviously, into consideration. So if you have mobile towers in the area, there should be better coverage. And you need to assess why isn't there coverage. Great. Um, then we, <laughs> what are some of our successes? We've also got a dashboard that we use internally and also in, in uh, um, discussions with the federal states. Um, but you can see the map and you can see the um, all the little, it's a little bit fuzzy um, at that scale, but you can see all the little um, market assessment areas. You can see we've got uh, 2,000, almost 3,000 search circles that were created. Um, and you can filter it down by, um, by a federal state. But this is done on ArcGIS and it runs on ArcGIS Enterprise. Um, uh, another dashboard that we have is um, all the little um, search circles. Um, you can see it was about 2,400 search circles there. And then the different statuses of those search circles in which um, status are there in terms of development. Right, everyone knows <laughs> why do we have these spreadsheets? Obviously we had spreadsheets because everybody knows how Excel works, sort of. Um, and at the beginning of the, of the company, we had limited um, IT infrastructure, so spreadsheets were handy. Everybody's got Excel on his PC, so let's go. Um, we had um, the guys set up quite a lot of spreadsheets, actually. In fact, five different spreadsheets that were interlinked with each other and taking coordinates from there and copied in there, etc. It was quite a mess. Um, and then obviously with Excel, you've always got the problem we've got like 20 planners, but only one guy at the time could work in Excel because otherwise you can't save it. So they made copies on their PC and then they saved it back and copied back and you know how this works, you know, then you make lots of errors. Um, so, and they built in lots of formulas as well. And the more formulas we had, the more complicated the spreadsheet gets. And obviously it got bigger and bigger and bigger and it gets slower and slower. And the big problem was also that we had no connection to the so-called webges. So the data that they had in the spreadsheets, we had to get somehow onto the ArcGIS Enterprise. And we made lots of little um, calculations and, and import routines and stuff just to get the data back into ArcGIS Enterprise to show it on the map and to put it into the dashboards. So <clears throat> nevertheless, the MIG planners actually managed with these spreadsheets quite well for some time. But as the company grew and we got more staff and more people working on it, it got complicated. Um, so in the end, we still had towers that were sort of starting to develop. Um, but we decided, you know, Excel at some stage needs to go. Um, so what are we going to do now? We need to get find something that we can do there. And obviously, QGIS comes to the rescue somehow. Um, first of all, Postgres Server we already had because the ArcGIS Enterprise took its data directly from the Postgres Server. Um, and <clears throat> the problem there was that we did not have direct access to the Postgres Server. No, we had as your data analysts, but the planners did not. They were in a different network. Um, so. <clears throat> We also had the ArcGIS Enterprise already set up, and that was also part of the company policy because they have been using ArcGIS Enterprise for many years. Um, so we had to live with it. Um, so the first thing that we had to do, was set up the tables from the spreadsheets. So everything that was in those spreadsheets columns in these hundreds of columns, we had to sort of put into different tables. Um, and then we obviously had to set them up with foreign keys and triggers so that things happen in the background. Um, then we had to install QGIS on all the PCs because it was available, fortunately, in the company. So everybody could just install QGIS on his PC. And uh, we had to set up the connection to the Postgres server. 
And because if the planners did not have direct access, we had to use um, ArcGIS REST server. Unfortunately, QGIS has the facility so that you can access the ArcGIS REST interface. Just to give you an, 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 ex, um, an example of how the tables are set up, these are a few of the tables and the little arrows that you can see in the, the lots of columns that we had are all connected to each other with foreign keys. So it was quite a mess to set up in the beginning, but we managed. So <clears throat> what are the challenges with the ArcGIS REST server connection? Firstly, the authorization. Um, fortunately, Niall and, and the North Road, they've written a quite a nice uh, setup how to, how to get, actually get it running properly. Um, and it works um, fantastic. But you can also use the Esri token, but it's only valid for two weeks, but it works just as well. Um, and you just need to get a new key every uh, a token every two weeks. Um, and then uh, we had to set up so-called the function users because we only had a limited number of licenses for ArcGIS. So we just used one user, so everybody logs in as the same user. <laughs> Um, which is also sort of counterproductive because you, you really can't see who's actually doing what in the end. But that was the only way that we could do it. Um, okay, so the QGIS, how did we get QGIS connected? Okay, once we've got it connected, obviously you have to load the necessary tables into a project, you do the table joins, you create attribute forms with, um, uh, we, we've done a lot of them with a the drag and drop. Lots of constraints and expressions, and if I get time, I'll show you a few. Um, and um, obviously, you organize the forms and the themes for different users, because the some planners need only a certain part of the project, others need a different part. And it's easier to maintain the themes than to have always different projects, because if you change something there, you also need to change it there. So it's better to have it all in one, make different themes, and then you go. Um, high tables that are not necessary for viewing from the layers panel, yes, because we had a lot of um, layers that are in the background, which a user doesn't have to see. Um, um, create a startup and close project macro. Um, I'm quickly going to get into that as well. Um, and that we basically use for the table and the field access management. So you set up different users and you, you define them and then you, the macro runs through and tells you these users can use that table and can edit that field. And the other user can't and can't see this or doesn't need those tables, so remove them, etc. So you can do quite a lot with those project macros, which is quite nice. Um, and then we created several models for data updates and exports. Because sometimes the guys still want to send out something to a client and just needs to be a simple table with uh, ID and this and coordinates and what is my status and you just do an export and they send it as an Excel. So um, those were the basic um, setup procedures. And then I'm going to go to, into some challenges. Now the challenges, um, I've got lots of them there and I can quickly, if I just look at my watch, I can leave out a few, I can skip a few. Um, but the setup um, of the connection, um, we needed to help the guys a lot to get that going. Um, for the editable layers, you need the so-called query layers, which you need to produce in ArcGIS. So in ArcGIS, you go in and you create a sort of a view or something that you want to make or uh, just the table as it is and say, select this and this uh, star from whatever table and just load it as a query layer onto the ArcGIS server. Um, once you've done that, you can actually access this query layer from QGIS and edit it. Edit the points, edit the geometry, um, any of the fields that you want to edit can do that. Um, for the database connections, you have also some limits because the REST API for ArcGIS Enterprise has got a few challenges. Some of them, you always need the serial field, which you should have anyway. Um, you must have, always must have a geometry field in the older ArcGIS versions. Um, the newer versions, you don't need that anymore. 
Um, you need the spatial index. Um, you have only field name lengths of a maximum of 31 characters. Imagine that's 31. I don't know why 32 or 30, I don't know, but it's 31. Um, <laughs> um, and um, <clears throat> the one um, of the other things is um, the text fields um, are also interesting. Um, they must be of type varchar and always with a with a number. So you, you can't just say varchar, it needs to be one or 25 or it must have a size. It can't be without a size. Um, and then the other interesting field is, is my favorite. You can only use certain characters, which uh, <laughs> which are crazy. You know, if somebody types in an enter and adds a new line to it, you know, it just won't save it. It just doesn't give you an error message or anything. It just doesn't save. So there are a few few little things that that were quite quite a bit of a challenge there. Um, then, as I said, we can we have permissions on different tables and different fields. As I said, we built them into the macro. You can probably not read it, and but, but I can um, open it later. But we did, for example, have for the planners different guys in the variables. We just put them into the variable, and say so if you are a planner, then you can do this. If you are uh, um, uh, whatever a student, then you can only do that, etc. So you just build them into a, into a variable and then use them in your Python macros. Um, <clears throat> then also, can we check the progress of the network status with milestones? Obviously, these milestones are something like, okay, I've handed the search circle over on a certain date. Then I found the property on a certain date, etc. So you may have milestones, and those milestones are calculated, and um, we can display them. Um, and the only thing that we did is we just used um, we just used uh, the the, cal the field calculator to create the um, to create those fields that run in the background all the time. Um, can we have the infrastructure? Atlas, um, the BNSR is basically providing an atlas of all the infrastructure that they have. Towers, lines, fiber, what, what, what. Can we build them in? Yeah, theoretically, it was a bit of a challenge because everybody needs a login and he needs to set up his own login, etc. You know how it works with logins. Um, but then um, large attribute forms. We have quite a few large attribute forms and, and you will see them better if I have the time for that. Um, but this, these ones are quite interesting. Uh, we have got large text fields, and obviously these text fields, again, difficult for people to handle with tabs and enter and whatever they're going to use. Um, then you have, um, as you can see, several tabs at the top, um, which are applicable to certain things that you can do and not do. Um, we always keep track as well, who changes what and when, so that we can always go back if the, if the manager sees, uh, who did this? And you can say, yeah, just look there, there's the date and the guy that last worked on it. Um, <clears throat> and then obviously the general stuff like the coordinates and and some, uh, and who's the planners and, and so on. So there's some general stuff on the forms as well. So you sort of have an orientation. But yeah, it makes the form very slow. In the end, yeah, the more stuff you put on these forms, um, the slower they get. Um, and then uh, when adding new tower candidates, can we automatically determine the IDs, location, etc.? Yes, you can. It's quite easy in QGIS. And I'll show you how we did that. It's actually quite easy to do. Um, because you just click on the map and it works out a lot of stuff for you. Um, import and export, um, always a challenge. Um, Atoll database is basically the planning tool where you set up a search circle and you can see in what direction, the, if you put antennas in certain directions, what coverage do you get? Um, we did that. Obviously, we uh, built a little bit of a model, and uh, yeah, uh, it's also quite a, quite a nice challenge always, these models, so, because people in the Atoll database type in stuff, um, which is not always uh, how it should be in the database. So you need to put in a lot of things there. 
Um, yeah, and then obviously candidates created, can we export them again? Yeah, we can do that. Um, bit of Python code, you know, um, can be done. Um, can we also um, have an output like we want to save it as an Excel file and a PDF? Yeah, yeah, we, we can probably do that. Um, and you can see the output on the right, but a lot of Python code, uh, which is obviously you don't do that in a day. Um, <clears throat> with the external guys, we also had a few external planners. And how did we handle them? It was actually not so difficult because all that we did is we sent them a special light package. Same QGIS project that we have, but just connecting to the special light package. And they send us back a geo package with only a few tables that we import again with the model. So it was not too difficult to do. Couple of smaller challenges, always. Um, we needed to upgrade from N ArcGIS Enterprise 10.8 to 11.1 .1 now. Uh, company policy, uh, we have to do everything over again. Once we have set it up, the new ArcGIS Enterprise, we need to set up the new connection, check that everything works in QGIS. So that was one of the things. And then um, also, um, always guys, can we get another field? Or that one we don't need anymore, you can take it out. Um, and so on, you know, so and, 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 and. Um, it's a never ending story. So um, I could uh, show you a couple of things, but I see I'm running out of time. So I think it's question time. Yeah. Um, thank you for the presentation. Can you go back to the uh, third slide when you talked about the joints? So can you go back to the third um, um, slide on the on the presentation? You tell me stop. <laughs> Stop. No, wait, this one, stop, sorry. So, um, oh no, sorry, one more, but the, the way I understood it, you have the, um, the, the, the table joins, um, um, you have the relations between the tables and you have them saved inside the QGIS project and this is why every person had to use the same QGIS project? Uh, no, the, 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 we, we, have, we, have, we actually have two, two projects. One is the, the, the big one for the, for the location planners who do the candidates. So they've got a lot of tables and a lot of relations. While the normal um, radio network planners, they only have a smaller, pro a scaled down project. And they only have a, a, f a lot fewer tables. They only have, because they only do the search circles. But the guys that do the candidates and all the planning after the candidate uh, uh, creation, so looking for uh, property, looking for the power, um, uh, data, data, et cetera, um, they've got the bigger project. But it's, it's basically the same thing, but we save it as and throw away a few layers. And, and how did you do the, the second line in the text, join tables for logical user interaction? How did you... Um... How did you yeah, execute all, all this? All that you do is we, we use, you basically connect the same, let's say you have your, your point and it's got coordinates, et cetera, and a few basics. And then you've got all the planning stuff in a separate table. And all the planning stuff has got the same ID as your, as your location. So you just join them up and then it knows. And it's fortunately, it's a one-to-one -one relationship because you can't have different planning stuff on the same circle. Yeah, for sure. But did you do the, did you do the join in the, on the database? Did you do the join inside uh, QGIS? Both. Both. Or did you do relations inside QGIS before, because there's like the relations uh, feature yes, and the you, join feature? Yeah, yeah. Some, some of them, the one to many is we used, um, we used the relations and the one to ones, we used the normal joins. I've also experimented with the one-to-ones with relations, but there's quite a few challenges because of those milestones. The milestones come from three different tables. So in the end, when you've got one-to-one -one relationships, you need to look in three different tables 
for the milestones. Some have three milestones, others have uh, five milestones, and then you need to join them in such a way and look in all those to actually get all the milestones connected in the end and say, okay, I'm at milestone nine, which comes from three different tables. That was the challenge with the relations. So the joins are better for that, but they are a lot slower. Mm. And I don't know if what you've experienced, but joins are quite slow, especially when you've got very long tables, like 80, 100 columns. Then the joins are very slow. The relations are a lot faster. Thank you a lot. We have time for maybe one more question. Um, can you just show us a walkthrough of just part of the database? Can you show us uh, you're using the, you said you could show us the database in use for a while? Yeah, can we see the live demo? Yeah, yeah, but well, just a minute or so, I yeah. can show you the... <laughs> Let's go out here. Um, okay, this is what the map basically looks like. So if I've got, uh, the, these are the different, you can see that, yeah, different candidates and these are the search circles. So if I, for example, want to create a, a, a new candidate there, I go there and you just basically go in and say create a point and I go in there somewhere and I click there. So it takes a, a few seconds and it will bring up a, will bring up the form, which it looks exactly the same as the entry, the entry form that you would use to change. But you can see in the background, it basically works out what is your next candidate ID, because once you've got A and B, it automatically works out for C. Then it works out the name for, the, for this candidate, and it uses the odd, which is the location where it is. Um, and then it automatically also has your longitude and latitude. Um, and it also checks the search circle. If the search circle has got a certain planner, it also works out the planner for, puts it in there for your candidate. So how do we do those? Um, I'm going to just cancel this. And if you go into the form itself, stop. The mouse. Attribute forms. Okay, you can see. Um, there's a few things. There's actually three, um, la uh, two layers connected to it. But if you go to the attribute form and you look into the candidate, you just have these um, uh, default, basically default worked out formula values. Can't remember what it is in English, but um, I've got an English QGIS and a German QGIS, so I'm getting totally confused. But you can see the formula. I don't know if you can read this, but I'm checking if there is uh, um, an, an, an ID already. If there is, isn't an ID, I say take the candidate ID and work out the maximum of the candidate ID and group it by the search circle. And if there is an A already, then you use B, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this, is a, this is just a few formulas that you put in. And they are, they're actually not too difficult to, um, to do. Um, the nice ones are the ones where you use, uh, for example, the nice feature in QGIS. Um, I'm sure a couple of you guys have worked with it, the overlay within. So you just check where the point lies and then you've got overlay, then you know which Bundesland and which federal state and in which, um, in which area of postal code it is, et cetera. So you can do quite a lot with that. Um, and that you do with a lot of these fields. But you can imagine the more of these formulas you've got in there, the slower it gets. So every time that I click and create a new candidate, um, it takes a couple of seconds to work out all these things. And the interesting thing there is also that the, the, um, the order in which these formulas run is sort of random. So you can't say that the first field formula runs first and the second comes then and the next comes then. So you need to check which one comes first because if you rely on, it has already worked out my location name or my uh, federal state and you use or the, the, the postal code um, name and you want to use it in the field above, it sometimes works but sometimes doesn't because it's random. It's random how it works out those formulas. So it can, might be that the formulas become quite complicated. So you need to work out 
then ID first, then the second name, then the um, uh, federal state, then the this, and then you, in the end you've got a formula like this. So it is a bit of a <laughs> playing around with it. Um, and then we obviously put restrictions on always these fields, you know. If it doesn't have, sometimes we put the in not only the formula, but then we also say you cannot, if it's not the, in the right format, then you can't save it. So the field gets this little cross at the back and says, no, no, you're not allowed to save. So there's a lot of things that you can do with these QGIS forms, quite powerful, but they get um, slow. A lot of people still have a lot of questions and it's a really complex but amazing uh, work. So thank you. A big round of applause for Imo. Thank you.